Uh, thanks everybody for coming here. So, um, okay, here's here's broadly what I want to do in this talk. It's going to be kind of sketchy, and I'm sure I'm going to go over some things too quickly. So I should say uh, the strategy I'm adopting is to try to be relatively brief and let you in the questions tell me uh, which of these many things you need um, more background on. But okay, so my two goals for today are to um, on the one hand, tell you about my context relative view of belief. Um, there are more and more people arguing for some kind of context relative view of belief these days. So I think this is, I think, I think the, the sort of moves that I'm going to make today are available to lots of people. Um, but for the sake of definiteness and for the sake of um, talking more about myself, I'm going to try and give you the details of my particular context relative view of belief. And then I want to talk about these three skeptical philosophers um, and explore what suspended judgment or lack of belief might look like for each of them, given that belief is context relative in the kind of way that I'm um, imagining. So um, I think there are lots of ways that this kind of comparison, so like taking context relative views and taking these people who um, say distinctive things about and about um, uh, giving you similar but different motivations for avoiding belief. Um, there are lots of different uh, upshots you could get from that that I think are uh, worth looking at. Yeah, I'm just going to tell you how I look at them and, and we can see what sort of uh, connections we might get. So the plan is roughly four sections. Um, the, the view that I've defended I have called sensitivism because all of the good isms were taken. Um, I'm stuck with that label now. And then we will talk respectively about uh, Sextus, Nagarjuna, and Zhuangzi, which I'm pretty sure are approximately the right ways to say those names. But I would be happy to be corrected if anyone in the audience knows better. So, OK, broadly speaking, when I say belief is context relative, I mean something like this. This works as a first pass. Belief is a relation not just between a believer and a proposition, but between a believer, a proposition, and some contextual parameter. So really, we should say S believes P relative to C. Um, let me back up a second. Um, differences between uh, various kinds of context relative views of belief will give you different answers to the question what this parameter C is going to be, how we characterize what a context is. Um, on my view, I'll say in a second, the, the thing that varies with context is something like a set of possibilities or of possible worlds that's relevant for that particular context. What makes a set of possibilities relevant? Maybe that's going to vary a lot, but maybe it'll be something in, in a lot of applications, it's going to be something like um, what the believer is taking seriously at the time. That's a phrase that I've used a bunch, um, which is maybe unfortunate. Um, other people have said, um, the sort of thing that might vary is, uh, so maybe they'll say uh, to believe that P full stop is to have credence, to have degree of belief above some threshold, and maybe the threshold is something that shifts from one context to another. Um, other folks have said, uh, uh, so a similar kind of picture, belief is uh, degree of belief above some threshold, but the threshold stays fixed and your degrees of belief change from context to context. Other people have uh, like a partition on possible worlds. Uh, now I'm just giving you useless details. There are lots of things that it could be. Um, what do these things all have in common? So when we say that belief is context relative, I think what this is going to boil down to is saying that there are two importantly different ways of going from believing that P to not believing. Maybe I should add a currently believing. I'm, I'm a little unhappy with that word, but if you press me on it, I can tell you why I have something like that stuck in there two importantly different ways of going from believing to not believing, what I'll call belief revision and context change. So here's, here's kind of the idea. I sometimes explain this by means of um, an analogy with weight and mass. So if we think of weight in like Newtonian um, physics uh, as a force exerted on an object due to gravity, that's something that might change. Your weight might change despite your mass staying fixed if you, you know, go up in, into space or at the top of a mountain or something. We might think of a, a change in your weight due to moving around as just a change of your context. You're in a different situation. And so like the, the sort of intrinsic stuff about you um, causes or amounts to um, a different weight. 
on the other hand, we could uh, change your weight by like adding substance to you and thereby altering your mass. Okay, why do I need this kind of analogy? Um, people talk about context sensitive this and that all over the place in um, philosophy and social science and so on. This is why all the good isms are taken. I can't call my view contextualism because that's been taken. Um, other kinds of notions that have like a factive component or a, some kind of normative evaluation. We might think that like different norms are applicable in different contexts, but this is just the descriptive thing. This is a view about belief, not rational belief, not justified belief, not any of that kind of stuff. And if I merely said, you know, people's beliefs are different when they're in different contexts, doesn't that just mean that like they change their minds sometimes? That's not a surprising thing. That's not interesting at all. I think in order to make sense of context relativity or context sensitivity in this kind of, uh, for something like belief, we need this sort of distinction between different ways of going from believing to not believing, some of which amount to a genuine change in your belief state and some of which just mean you're in different circumstances. So this is the distinction I've got in mind between belief revision and context change. Okay, Here's, here are some details of my particular view. So my view says uh, to believe that P is to, in some do doxastic sense, rule out all possibilities where P is false, all not P possibilities. The context relativity comes in with the quantifier. Context determines the quantifier's domain, namely a set of possibilities. When I'm saying all not P possibilities, which ones count? Um, as a side note, I, I say we have the same deal for credence or confidence or partial belief or whatever you want to call it. Um, to have a credence of X in P is to assign a weight of X to the P possibilities collectively. And again, we have a, a quantifier asking about the possibilities where P is true. Um, we can use this to relate full and partial belief. Um, I say to rule out a possibility is to assign it weight zero. And this gets us a view where uh, belief is credence one, um, which is a nice kind of view to defend because you get lots of citations and footnotes where people used to just say, nobody thinks that belief is credence one. And now they say somebody does. Um, it's cheap, it's good. I'm gonna to appeal to this when I apply for promotion. Um, why might we think this sort of thing is true? Or how might we understand what the view is? Um, take an analogy with assertion, like a Stolnikarian picture of how assertion works and think of the common ground or presuppositions in a conversational context. So here's a picture. Here's a picture of the entire space of possible worlds. You for universe, the big rectangle is supposed to stand for, uh, represent the entire space of all possible worlds, which I have sorted into the ones where P is true and the ones where P is false. As a first pass at what you do when you assert that P, well, when you assert the P in a conversation, uh, if you succeed, Stonehooker says, um, then P gets added to the common ground. What does the common ground do? It sort of rules out things that we all agree are, are not the case. So when I add um, P to the common ground, the space of possibilities that we're taking seriously gets smaller, all the ones we were previously um, considering, or that you know, previously were considered consistent with the common ground, uh, where p is false, those now get thrown out, and we update ourselves to the just the rectangle on the right half of the screen. Okay, that works as a first pass. Except, I pretended that we were dealing with the entire universe of possible worlds to begin with. But really, we already had some stuff in the common ground beforehand. So I need like not just the distinction between the uh, possibilities consistent with common ground after my successful assertion and the ones that I ruled out, but I also need the ones that we were already ignoring because they were um, inconsistent with the previous common ground. So what, is it, what does it look like when somebody successfully asserts that P? It looks like going from a situation where we have sort of the whole egg here um, as consistent with our the common ground in our conversational context to the right half of the egg, or the right part of the egg, just the things that are consistent with P and the prior common ground. Okay, what does that mean? That means that the effect of asserting that P successfully um, is going to be different in different conversations. 
Um, one way you can think about it is when I, uh, when I assert that P, what I'm aiming to do is rule out those possibilities that are sort of shaded out in the medium color, right? If you can see my cursor, this bit. When I assert that P, I'm aiming to rule those things out. And what those things are is going to vary depending on what the previous common ground was. Okay, so the previous common ground is going to be the analog of that uh, contextually relevant set of possibilities I was talking about for belief. Um, I, I have a paper arguing on the basis of exactly this picture of what assertion does, plus a link between belief and sincere assertion to the view. Um, right, okay, that's approximately what this view is. Um, here is a slide that I'm not going to go through. This is here to pop some references onto the, uh, the, the version you've downloaded and just tell you what kinds of problems this solves. But I'm not really here to tell you today that this thing is true. I'm, I'm asking you to pretend that we have this and see what interesting things we can say about um, skeptics. So, okay. That tells you something about what context relativity is, what it means to shift contexts rather than revise your beliefs. But there's still this question about like, what's the analog of mass in this picture? If we're thinking of your beliefs as like weight, something that's produced from both some sort of intrinsic property of you and the context you're in, what is the thing that is unchanged when you have uh, a change of context? Um, let's just call that a belief state. So what is a belief state going to look like on this sort of sensitivist picture? Okay, so granted that belief is context relative, we shouldn't model belief states as sets of propositions as is sort of normally done. We need something like um, an assignment of sets of propositions to context. I need to know what you would believe for each of these sort of inputs of what set of possibilities are you taking seriously? So given that context change is a way of going from believing P to not believing, that doesn't amount to belief revision, we need a way of modeling that change without revising your belief state. So here's the solution, the official solution. Uh, we are going to represent belief states as consisting of a set of possibilities, the whole universe of possibilities, a plausibility ordering on those possibilities that tells you like, if you're comparing one possibility with another one, are you inclined to rule one out in favor of the other? And subsets of those possibilities that count as contexts. Okay, those three things together are going to tell you uh, what you would believe in any given context where context is a, um, a subset of possibilities. What are the things that you would rule out? What are the things that you would not? Okay, what is context change then? Context change means changing which subset is a current. Again, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with the word a current. I think I'm not using it in exactly the way that people traditionally sort of talk about a current belief, which tends to involve like imagining some sentence happening in your head, like in a voice or something. Um, that sounds weird to me. That doesn't sound like belief, but uh, the what I'm describing as um, a current contexts would be something like the, the way that you're actively thinking about something in a particular case. Um, let me illustrate what this might look like. So here's an example that I'll use again. So imagine your universe just has four different possibilities. I'm going to call these uh, one hand and two hand, uh, and then duplicates of those where you're a brain and a bat, just cause. So imagine we have um, an ordinary, context where you're not thinking about the possibility that you're a brain and a bat, you're not taking those possibilities seriously, they just don't come up. You might be considering just the possibility um, that you have two hands and the possibility that you have one hand in some ordinary kind of way where, I don't know, you lost it in an um, One of those things is shaded out more than the other, which tells me you're ruling that one out. So we would say then, I would say, uh, relative to this ordinary context, you would believe that you have two hands. Okay, we could also consider uh, what I'll call a skeptical context or a context where you're considering the, where you're taking seriously the skeptical hypothesis that you might be a brain and a bat having experiences exactly like yours. Uh, so here again, we've got uh, two different possible worlds that 
uh, are unruled out, that are maximally plausible by your plausibility ordering, the, the bottom two, one of, in one of which you have hands, in one of which you don't. You are having an experience as of having two hands, but in fact, you are a handless brain in a vat. Um, and then we've got the one-handed counterparts of those things. So I'm, I'm about to sort of change the notation here uh, and say, so you, you might not be able to see this too well. This is supposed to be a darker shading than this one. Um, I have trouble starting to, I have trouble seeing very clearly the different um, gradations of grayscale here. Uh, so we can replace those things with arrows. Use arrows to say, so an arrow from one possibility to the next says, I would rule out this one in favor of the one we're pointing at. So we can look at this thing and say, these guys are highest in the pl plausibility ordering. Here's, so here, this diagram, this is like a complete picture of a belief state. We have the universe of possible worlds. That's just the set of all the dots here. We have a plausibility ordering on them. And the circles, the, the ellipses here are giving us um, subsets. In this case, only one of them is a proper subset. Subsets characterizing different contexts, different restricted sets of possibilities you might be taking seriously. Okay, that's the view. So the next thing we're going to do is uh, think about what, um, what a skeptical in the sort of suspensive or uh, if I can say this Peronian um, kind of sense of skeptical, what a skeptical belief state might look like. If you're somebody who suspends judgment all over the place or uh, avoids belief because of what somebody like Sextus or Nagarjuna or Zhuangzi tells you, um, what is your belief state going to look like? Okay. Um, Sorry, I should say before I launch into these things, uh, Diego did say my, uh, my, in his introduction, my specialism is epistemology and I mostly spend my time working on epistemic contextualism. I'm, I'm a newcomer to all three of these people. Um, I find them absolutely fascinating and I've been reading as much as I can, but I've only been on them for a few years now. Um, and I would be uh, very glad to hear, um, to have correction from any of you about things that I get wrong, but I'm gonna do my best. So here we go, okay. Uh, yeah, just a caveat, I'm going to use words like skeptic and skepticism a bunch, and he, I, I always just have in mind something like uh, commitment or desire or whatever to suspend judgment and avoid belief. I don't have, I have nothing to say about knowledge. I never have, and I probably never will. I think it's the most boring concept there is. Don't, don't tell the establishment I said that. Um, I also have no idea how to spell skeptic or anything anymore. Um, Canadian spelling is already confusing because we sort of choose at random between British and American things. And now I'm trying to adapt to a UK spelling. It's really confusing. Okay, so let's start here. Um, skeptics, Sextus tells us, are people with a certain ability, the ability to produce tranquility by producing suspended judgment, by setting out oppositions of equal strength. Okay, how does this ability work? The ability works by using the modes, Modes are, as I understand them, a battery of argument types, um, often appealing to one or another kind of relativity, which oppose things to each other. Um, so they say, so here's how I understand the way these things work. When you find yourself in danger of judging that P, um, use an appropriate mode to get yourself an equal strength appearance that not P, and then you'll wind up suspending judgment. So um, I uh, seem to be in danger of judging that this thing is, actually, I don't know what you call that color. Let's say purple. Um, Maybe I consider the mode of uh, preparations, if I'm remembering it right. Um, and I think, you know, if I slice this thing real thin, it wouldn't look purple anymore. It would look white. Um, maybe if I stuck it under a microscope, it wouldn't even look white. It would look like something else. So why should I think that it's, uh, why should I trust this appearance over the, the other one? And hey, presto, I wind up um, suspending judgment about this thing. Okay, so. Here are some things that I take to be characteristic, at least of Sextus's, um, Sextus's skepticism, although um, I know there's some controversy about how many of these things are, are essential and sort of uh, which, ones, which ones we might be willing to give up. So first of all, this is, the Pyrrhonist suspends, ju suspends judgment. Um, I should also say, um, I, I know that there, there's sort of a, a activist literature nowadays on whether suspended judgment means the same thing as uh, lack of belief. 
or whether we should treat it as an attitude in its own right. I'm just going to use suspended judgment as a uh, shorthand for lack of belief. Um, not because of any principled stand, but just because it's a handy shorthand for the thing I'm interested in. Okay, fairness, suspend judgment, or if you like, avoid belief. The way they get there, the way they the way they achieve suspension is via the modes. Maybe not, maybe not always, maybe once you're a fully trained pyrrhonist, you don't need to use those things, but they sure seem to be a big part of the picture Sextus gives us, at least if we judge by how many words he spends on, on explaining the modes. Um, there's a sense of belief in which Pyrrhonists do have beliefs, notwithstanding, not, uh, notwithstanding the above. So the fun, some of the fun stuff in Sextus is him saying, well, look, sometimes people say um, uh, dogma in a broad sense, and sometimes they say it in a narrow sense, and we don't do it in the narrow sense, but in the broad sense in which it's just acquiescing to an appearance. Yeah, of course we do that. We can't help it. Um, and let me tell you about how appearances work. There are a bunch of different kinds, and we go along with them. But don't worry, this isn't the bad kind of belief because um, we don't do this dogmatically. We don't think that things are thus and so in themselves and so on. But we have a, we have a criterion of action, although not a criterion of truth. So that's that other part. Pyrrhonists follow appearances holding no opinion about reality. We, we are active. Um, we do lead relatively normal lives uh, because we, can we just follow the appearances. Um, and suspending judgment removes a barrier to tranquility. Um, how essential this is, uh, Diego in particular knows much better than I do. Okay, so if we're gonna take this picture of suspended judgment of a sort of skeptical kind of person um, and try to uh, duplicate that picture using the, um, the, the framework for characterizing belief states that I've been given earlier, what are we going to wind up with? So, so here's the central idea. I wanna suggest that Peronian suspension of judgment involves context change rather than belief revision. So given that I'm talking here about different kinds of change, um, you should, I guess, not take too seriously the thing I said a, a second ago about suspension of judgment just being the lack of belief. Here I'm talking about something like an act, something like um, getting yourself from believing something to not believing it. I'm still just thinking of suspension of judgment as a state as just the absence of belief, but okay. So the sort of suspension of judgment the Peronians do involves context change rather than belief revision. If we're going to stick with the, the picture where the tranquility stuff is important, I'm gonna suggest that believing occurrently is a, an obstacle to tranquility. So when you find yourself disturbed by a belief that P, you, you use an appropriate mode to bring a not P possibility to mind, one you wouldn't rule out. Um, so that, that involves going from one context where you have a small number of possibilities you're taking seriously to a larger space where uh, you have some non-P possibility you wouldn't rule out. And then the picture tells me relative to that expanded context, you don't count as believing P. Um, if we don't want to lean too much on the tranquility stuff, then you can take that part of the motivation out of the picture. I mean, we still might just think if you um, are trying to get to the truth and you notice that you have caught yourself believing something, then maybe you um, start worrying more about it. And you think, I better run through the modes and make sure there isn't something I've missed. Um, or you think, you know, I'm persuaded by this argument, but maybe I should take seriously the possibility that there's a, another more persuasive argument for the contrary uh, conclusion. Um, and then that possibility comes in. So I, I think the, the motivation here is not super essential to the picture that I'm giving. Okay, if that's what happens when you suspend judgment um, sextus style, then what kind of constraint do we have on belief states? Here's my answer. So our constraint is for any context C relative to which one believes a proposition P, your belief state must have an enlarged context C prime relative to which one does not believe P and which one can reach from C by mental effort. So whether you use the modes or not, I think part of the picture is if there's something that's, whether it's causing me distress or just something that I care about in my inquiry and I notice that I'm believing something, um, I should be able by uh, mental effort, maybe sort of habitual mental effort um, to get to a state where I don't believe that. 
So I'm suggesting we could characterize that kind of move from believing P to suspending judgment on P to from believing P to not believing P um, as context change rather than belief revision. Why would that be helpful? Because then we can make sense of two different kinds of belief, right? We can say, look, the skeptic believes things relative to various contexts, but you shouldn't take any of that too seriously. Cause like, look, if you ask them to think more carefully without even revising their beliefs, without actually changing their minds, they can get to not believing anymore. Maybe we can characterize like the bad dogmatic kind of believing as, you know, having some, uh, some kind of, uh, you know, heart of hearts type context that, you know, gets the, the thing that you're, you're most convinced of, right? Uh, that you can't be shaken from just by thinking more carefully, just by considering more possibilities. Um, uh, I, I should note a variation we could have here, depending on what kind of skeptic you want to be. I said for any context relative to which you believe something, maybe some of those are fine. Maybe, maybe we don't think you, um, always have to be able to suspend judgment on everything. Maybe some things are forced on you. Uh, there's, there's room to maneuver here, but okay. So exactly this kind of shift that I was describing before, going from a context where you have some belief like that you have hands or something you know more interesting to someone like Sextus, um, we can eliminate that by through some kind of mental effort, taking seriously more possibilities so this is, this is really a move from ignoring some possibilities to no longer ignoring them, rather than sort of discovering something that, um, uh, uh, discovering something that you didn't know about before, or like revising your plausibility ordering on states. Uh, not that that's how anyone explicitly thinks to themselves about what they're doing. Um, yeah, okay, that's kind of the picture there. Okay, let me talk about Nagarjuna. So Nagarjuna, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm going to guess that most people in this audience have um, more background on Sextus than on Nagarjuna or Zhuangzi. So I will, despite what I said before, say a little bit of background. So uh, Nagarjuna is an early Mahayana Buddhist philosopher. Um, one way of character, so his, his probably his uh, signature um, claim or his signature thing um, sorry, like Sextus, he's someone who says, I don't actually have any thesis of my own. So I'm, I'm dodging around the normal words you'd use. Um, his signature slogan is, uh, everything is empty. What does that mean? So prior Buddhist philosophers, um, the Abhidharma schools, uh, following the Buddhist doctrine of no self, would explicate that kind of thing by saying, so first of all, there's a, there's a distinction between um, ultimate truth and conventional truth. There are some things that we say just because that's sort of a useful, they're useful fictions or something like that. Uh, one of the famous examples of this is, so from a dialogue called the Questions of King Melinda, there's a, a Buddhist monk named Nagasena who uh, sort of shows up in, in the king's court and the king uh, says, you know, oh, who is this before me? And the guy says, it's me, Nagasena. And the king says, but I thought there was no self. How could it be that there's a Nagasena before me? That doesn't make any sense. What does Nagasena point to if there are no selves? And Nagasena uses this um, analogy with um, chariots. Uh, so he says, king, you came here in a chariot, didn't you? I, which I guess was the style at the time. Um, and he says, so what was this? chariot what is what is that thing is it um is it its axle is it its wheel is it something else and goes through all these options and says well the chariot can't be identical with any of its parts that doesn't make any sense um it can't just be the totality of its parts because if you took one away you'd still have the chariot uh, it can't be something outside of the chariot um because that doesn't make any sense either uh so really there's no chariot but hey, we say I came here in a chariot because it's useful to sort of point at that collection of objects um, just in order to get around. And hey, the same thing's true about me. Okay, so there's some kind of process, don't worry too much about whether those are good arguments. There's some kind of process of analysis here of deciding that some complex object isn't ultimately real because of 
an inability to identify it with um, something enduring, if you like. So the Abhidharma schools would say, um, that's how the no self doctrine works. So when the Buddha says, you don't have a self that um, exists from moment to moment, you don't have a self that is going to be reborn. Um, and that's an answer to you know, uh, problems in Indian philosophy and religion. Um, the, that doctrine applies to all kinds of things. Not literally everything, but all kinds of things, all of the objects that we encounter in everyday life. Um, but hey, this, this process of analysis has an ending. Like you could run the same analysis on, let's say, not just the chariot, but its wheels. Is the wheel its spokes? Is it the hub? Is it the whatever else wheels are made of? No, but eventually you're going to get down to bedrock. You're going to wind up with um, some little bits of stuff, um, which may be material, which may be um, mental, maybe all kinds of things. But look, there are, there's going to be some atoms at the end of this. Okay, Nagarjuna comes along and says, not only are chariots empty, um, even the atoms, even uh, dharmas, they're called, even dharmas are empty. There is absolutely everything is empty. Okay, this category of emptiness also applies to verbal stuff. A doctrine can, or a, a thesis, a claim can be empty. And that seems to amount to something like not being ultimately true. And Nagarjuna thinks even those things are empty. So let's get on to why people often compare um, Nagarjuna with Sextus. Does Nagarjuna recommend suspending judgment or relinquishing all views? That's one thing you could do in response to saying nothing is true, which isn't exactly what he says, but saying that everything is empty. You might think that means you should suspend judgment. You might also think do something else. He does sometimes explicitly say these sorts of things. So in the, so the, the sort of definitional text that is, uh, Nagarjuna is like by definition the author of this thing, the MMK, the Mula Madhyamaka Karika, the fundamental verses on the middle way. Uh, sorry, Madhyamaka uh, means something like middle way. That is the name of Nagarjuna's school of Mahayana Buddhism. Uh, so here's one translation from Siddharth and Katsura. Uh, he says, I salute Gautama, the Buddha, who based on compassion taught the true Dharma for the abandonment of all views. We should abandon all views. Something, another text um, widely attributed to Nagarjuna, although there are questions about um, whether the author of these things, the authors of these things are the same, the Vivi, the Vigrahavya Vartani. Um, he deals with an objection from somebody arguing, you say everything is empty. Well, what about the thesis that everything is empty? Got you there, aren't you self-defeating? And his response is, if I had any thesis, that fault would apply to me, but I do not have any thesis, so there is no fault for me. Okay. Um, there are varying interpretations about how to, um, how to interpret this. There, there are different views on this kind of thing. I'm gonna talk about two of them. So the translation I'm using here for the VV is Jan Westerhoff's. Uh, I'm also going to talk about uh, Ethan Mills in this, um, really fantastic book, Three Pillars of Skepticism in Classical India. So they have conflicting interpretations of this thing. So here's the question. This isn't just Ethan's question. This is everybody's question. Um, how can Nagarjuna simultaneously argue in favor of a view that all things are empty while also encouraging the abandonment of all views? Uh, Westerhoff also says something like this. He says, uh, this is just obviously false. You say you have no thesis, but look at all those theses you have that you keep arguing for, like in the other book and in this one. So how should we make sense of this? Okay, Mill's answer to the, the question how we can do this is uh, what he calls skepticism about philosophy, um, which I think is gonna have echoes of sexism. So this skepticism about philosophy involves uh, a form of intellectual therapy with the goal of creating a mental coolness wherein one's impulse to form beliefs, at least about philosophical matters is dissipated. Why should we suspend judgment or avoid or abandon all views because everything is empty? So, so here's, a, here's a way that uh, Nagarjuna is importantly distinct from Sextus. Nagarjuna inherits this soteriological commitment to 
Um, so, so this Buddhist idea that in order to um, escape suffering, in order to reach nirvana, in order to extinguish um, all the bad stuff, um, a central thing you need is right view. You need to correctly understand the way things are. One of the central barriers to um, the good stuff is delusion. So if the ultimate truth is that everything is empty, then in order for our view to reflect that, we need to abandon all views. Okay. So, right, Nagarjuna argues extensively that nothing is self-existent, nothing has svabhava. This is a way of, svabhava means something like self-essence. When Nagarjuna says things are empty, that means they're empty of svabhava. How should we translate that? It gets translated in lots of different ways. It doesn't exactly map onto things. I'm not going to get into that. Um, here is a way that um, a, another prominent scholar puts this interpretation of the view. The ultimate truth is that there is no ultimate truth. And Sideritz's gloss on this is that there's, uh, this, this is sloganeering, there's, an, there's a, an equivocation. The ultimate truth in the sense of the thing that you need to realize in order to, or, or the thing you need to understand in order to achieve enlightenment is that there is no ultimate truth, meaning um, uh, you know, things that survive this kind of uh, analysis we were looking at before. There is nothing that is sort of eternally true in some kind of weighty sense, as opposed to merely conventionally true. Okay. What does Westerhoff think about this? So Westerhoff's commentary on that, uh, I have no thesis passage. He says, Nagarjuna does not make the obviously false, obviously false claim that he asserts no theses whatsoever. After all, there are these texts, the MMK, the VV, and so forth, all of which are filled with philosophical theses and thereby contradict this way of understanding Nagarjuna's verse, the way we were just looking at. What Nagarjuna wants to say here is that he doesn't have any thesis of a particular kind, that is, that among the theses one should assert, there is none which exists substantially, none which is to be interpreted according to the familiar realist rather than conventionalist semantics just described. Okay, I think there's something very similar here to Sextus's distinction between uh, a broad and a narrow sense of dogmatizing, um, but that's that's something for scholars of these two to um, sort out between themselves. Okay, so here here's the picture. I think I wind up with trying to trying to reconcile what all these people say about what's going on. There's uh, there's a conflict between Westerhoff's reading and Mill's reading. So Mill's skeptical reading of Nagarjuna goes something like this: um, Nagarjuna's statement of positionlessness should be taken at face value. The arguments in these various texts maybe shouldn't be taken exactly at face value. They serve a therapeutic purpose to help us give up any impulse to theorize, at least about maybe just about philosophical things, maybe about everyday things. That's up for grabs. On the other hand, uh, both Sideritz and Westerhoff have a conventionalist or anti-realist interpretation. They say, his arguments for emptiness, his arguments against various kinds of realist views should be taken at face value. But his statements of positionlessness need to be read as qualified. Okay, and again, there are parallels with the, the stuff in the um, secondary literature on Peronian skepticism, um, like the, the um, apparatic versus suspensive kind of stuff. I don't know, ah, uh, other people who know these things better than that. I just get excited about it anyway. Okay. I think the version of skeptical non-belief um, that I'll offer in a second, which is a little bit stronger than the one I had for Sextus, uh, makes these more compatible than they might otherwise seem. So here's the central idea for applying the context relative stuff, uh, particularly my version, I guess, um, to Nagarjuna. I'm going to say treating a thesis as ultimately true means having a belief state with a distinguished context reflecting your heart of hearts. So that sort of thing I was talking about before, like a, a top of the uh, plausibility ordering and a context that's, you know, that you can't be shifted out of by thinking more carefully, something that reflects your, your maximally careful thoughts about the world. Um, but without having that kind of distinguished context, you can still speak sincerely about conventional truths or one's beliefs about the conventional truths, the conventional truth according to you. 
So the constraint on your belief state is that there should be no non-trivial maximum to the plausibility ordering on possibilities. That doesn't have to mean that the, the ordering goes on infinitely and there's always something more plausible you could look at. Um, it's okay if um, among the, uh, let's stipulate multiple maximally plausible possible worlds, um, there's nothing or nothing interesting uh, that's true in all of them. Okay, so they differ enough. So stated more formally, for any proposition P, if there's a maximally plausible possibility W, where P is true at W, then there must also be a maximally plausible W prime, where P is not true at W prime. Okay. Um, so you might have a picture like this. This is, a, this is an unduly complicated picture, but um, it was quicker to reuse an old one than to draw a new one. Sorry, is this saying something about how much I value my audience's time? I'm sorry. Um, okay, here's a picture, a partial picture of a belief state. So here's just beliefs and uh, plausibility, sorry, uh, possibilities and a plausibility ordering on them. The maximally plausible ones are down at the bottom. These guys, C1 through C2 to the N minus one, um, are all equally plausible and more plausible than uh, anything else. Okay, let's add some context on here. Maybe there is a, a heart of hearts context, something that just considers those maximally plausible worlds. This is still compatible with the, um, uh, with the constraint I suggested. And maybe we have some other uh, ones that are ordered in some kind of way dealing with more conventional truths. Uh, thing. Um, this can still be okay uh, as long as there's enough variation between those maximally plausible possibilities about which propositions are true there. We can't, if we have minus one seems like, yeah, no, that seems like the right amount. This is, this is how many you need uh, in order to have uh, of n propositions, none of them true at um, all of those maximally plausible plausible worlds. So if we have something like this, then uh, we're okay. That I think is stronger than the thing I was suggesting for Sextus, although I'm, I'm running short on time and getting myself confused. So if, uh, maybe this will be clearer to you because you're not thinking about what words to say next, but you can ask me about it in questions and I'll try and do better. Okay. Um, I realize I've been talking for a while. I'm going to be briefer about Zhuangzi, partly because um, although I find him extremely fascinating, I also find him extremely confusing. So uh, Zhuangzi is a uh, warring states period um, Chinese philosopher. He, what, he lived um, uh, sometime after Confucius. He's probably a contemporary of uh, Mencius, Mengzi, because um, they're allusions to, they allude to each other. So this is, uh, I, I think we think roughly fifth century, fourth century some small number of centuries um, BCE. Okay, so the Zhuangzi is a uh, rich and um, difficult to, uh, a rich text, difficult to give a single interpretation of because it's kind of all over the place. Um, but I'm going to suggest, okay, mainly leaning on the secondary literature, there are people who see um, something like Peronian skepticism going on here, something like suspensive skepticism going on here. Um, Kelberg in the 90s says, despite differences in style, Zhuangzi and Sextus employ similar arguments toward the similar goal of inducing the reader to suspend judgments over things she can't be sure of. Um, conflicting appearances show up, disagreement shows up as a reason um, why you should suspend judgment. The problem of the criterion, um, if you want to say that's something Sextus worries about is definitely something Zhuangzi talks about. Um, Eric Schwitzgabel in also in the mid 90s suggests that Zhuangzi is what he calls an everyday skeptic. Um, there's, there's this therapeutic aim here again. Um, he wants to jolt the reader into a certain kind of everyday skepticism, a kind of open-mindedness that consists in putting somewhat less faith than is standard in one's own and others' beliefs. Okay. If this is the kind of skepticism that Zhuangzi urges, the previous sensitivist models should work here too. Um, but <laughs> here's, the, here's the second reason why I'm going to be brief about him. Um, we can find a more difficult and radical kind of skeptical interpretation here too. So I think the very kind of thing that I've been 
um, saying is constitutive of belief, even belief relative to a particular context, um, uh, Zhuangzi has doubts about. So this very thing of like ruling out one possibility in favor of another, you can read Zhuangzi as saying, uh, just doing that, you're, you're, gonna run, you're only going to run into problems. Um, so one way of seeing this is, uh, so Julian Chung has some uh, really nice recent papers saying, Zhuangzi can profitably be interpreted as a global force fictionalist arguing that all discourse should be seen as not truth directed. So like Zhuangzi has some characteristically linguistic skepticism going on. He thinks whenever we start trying to put claims into words, we run into trouble. And part of that has to do with our trying to find criteria to distinguish, you know, this thing is true and that thing is false. All of those kinds of um, ways of carving up the world look arbitrary. Um, I'm gonna skip through skeptical passages in the text because I've gone on too long but they're there if you want to look at them. So here's, here's the central idea that worries me. So Zhuangzi says all the, the um, so all sort of shi fei distinctions, that is distinctions between uh, it's this, it's not that, um, all of those things are unreliable. So here's the worry, the unreliability of all of those distinctions means any sort of ruling out of possibilities should be avoided. But, I'm committed to belief being closely tied to assertion. So his problems with assertion are gonna translate into problems for belief, right? Just as we shouldn't declare that's it, that's not. So we shouldn't judge that's it, that's not. Um, so what constraint do we get on belief states? Um, uh, maybe you shouldn't do any of those things. Um, maybe whenever you try to judge that one proposition is true and another one's false, even, like saying, if the world is uh, one of these two ones, it's this one rather than that. Yeah, the whole thing might be in trouble, um, which I think is cool. Like if we have these three people who often get compared, when people do comparative, um, you know, cross-cultural stuff on these kinds of skeptics, they often say, hey, here are three people who are all suspensive kinds of um, skeptics. Um, if one of them turns out more radical than the others, and there's a helpful way of illustrating that, I think that's neat. Um, so that's where I'm going to stop in just sort of confusion, which seems appropriate for the topic. Anyway, thanks.